Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, well, thank you guys for joining, uh, especially at lunchtime. So hopefully I can satiate your intellectual curiosity, although not your mirror pains. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I know some folks are still filtering in. Um, so I'm senior director at Berkeley Skydeck. By a quick show of hands, how many people have heard of Skydeck? No, <laughs> so, so I'm like a third, okay. Um, so the primary gist of this talk today is really about why American accelerators are really acting as a real channel and launch pad into the US market and frankly into the global market. Um, if I can achieve one thing today during this talk, my goal is to really demystify what a US accelerator does and how it can really serve as a conduit for Korean startups and startups from around the world to basically enter the US market and really kind of get global validation, raise serious money from Silicon investors, uh, Silicon Valley investors, and really expand globally. So, so three things that we'll be covering on. Um, first, I'm gonna start with Skydeck's story, tell you a little bit about our genesis, how we've tracked over the past couple of years, uh, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the trends I've been observing in Silicon Valley, and it kind of highlight and surface the things that I think are particularly salient for both investors and entrepreneurs in Korea. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about why these accelerators are really serving as a sandbox for global innovation. So starting with Skedek's story. Well, uh, just in December, we really kind of sat down as a team to kind of reevaluate what our primary mission is and what our values are. And we hadn't really done that in the past couple of years. Um, you know, so we sat down over a week and we started talking about our high level objectives, everything that we really want to focus on and achieve over the next decade. And we really settled on one idea, one idea and concept. And that is that as the key accelerator at UC Berkeley, and as an accelerator open to founders from around the world, we really want to be the top global hub for entrepreneurship. Uh, and we believe that we can do that because we're uniquely positioned and I'll kind of go into our story more and explain why. Um, in terms of how we can achieve that, uh, there are a couple of things. Well, Berkeley has been rated a top research university for some time, so we, we feel that we can ask, help our founders access world-class resources. So all of our founders can access our research facilities and labs, um, a lot of the classes, our faculty. So we have exceptional faculty and we have 500,000 living in alumni, many of whom, the majority of them who live in the Bay Area. And it becomes really easy for us to connect our founders with these alumni. So what are our values? Uh, I tell you all of this, not as a sales pitch for Skydeck. <laughs> of course, I'm you know, somewhat biased and partisan, but uh, it's important to kind of understand with so many different accelerators out there, what actually differentiates each one. So for us, what we found to be most crucial to our identity and our brand is that first and foremost, we are founder focused. And number two, we are very, we are very globally oriented. So as a founder, when you come to Skydeck, you have six months in our office with us. And we, the staff and the advisors, we make it our business to know what you're working on, how you're tracking, what you need help with, who you need to connect with and plug in with. Um, we're very dynamic, we have a very open door policy, literally open door, like we keep the front door to our office open so that people can walk in. Sometimes we get a few homeless people walking in, but yeah, we do have an open door policy and we really encourage any entrepreneurs who are curious to understand how they can work with us, that they can just come in and talk to us at any point in time. Um, our team is actually, sorry, the formatting got screwed up. Uh, our team is actually quite small, so there are, we're broken into two separate legal entities, which I'll kind of explain why we do this. Uh, but on the one side, we have the program and the organization. So I sit on the program organization side, and then separately, we have the fund. Um, so on the program side, we're really focused on curating all of the you know, curriculum, the, the events. Um, and the fund side, they really oversee the capital deployment. And the reason we keep it as two separate entities is all of the money we've raised for our fund is through institutional investors and VCs. 
in Silicon Valley. So in terms of just deploying capital, we make it really easy for our fund to do that without having a conflict of interest with UC Berkeley. Since on the organizational side, we're, we are actually UC Berkeley employees. Um, so one of the things that you'll kind of, kind of pick up when you look at accelerators, if you're contemplating <coughs> The, you know, potentially moving to an accelerator and trying to pick which ones. Uh, there are various types of uh, different accelerators, right? So Skydeck is actually a university accelerator, and that's because we're tied to the University of UC Berkeley. Um, one of the things, as I mentioned, that makes us uniquely different is, because, is, one, is that we're, we have very you know, deep, intimate ties with campus leadership. So we only have three board members. One's the dean of our business school, the other is our dean of engineering, and finally we also have the vice chancellor. Um, that actually serves us well, because when you walk around UC Berkeley campus, most students know Skydeck. Actually, we have the tallest building in Berkeley, <laughs> and on the building it says Skydeck, so at night you can see the building lit up with our name on it. But it really helps serve us, serves us in many ways. One of the ways is that a lot of students, graduate students, postdocs, and faculty, when they have a business idea that they want to kind of potentially you know, test out, the first place they think is actually Skydeck. Um, so we've been growing our reputation across campus, and that's really been helpful in terms of increasing our talent pool. So we have four offices. Um, we have our primary office, which is the one on the far right, the Skydeck building in downtown Berkeley. When you come up the subway, we're right in front of you. Um, we have two floors at, um, in our building, and we'll probably expand to a third floor at some point in time. That actually means we have over 20,000 square feet of space. Most of our companies work in our office. So we have two cohorts, each, each every six months, and each cohort has 145 startups. So we have a lot of, several hundred founders in our office every day. It's pretty incredible. Um, we also have a San Francisco presence. That's through a UC Berkeley partnership with UC Berkeley Extension. So any founders that have meetings uh, in, in the city of San Francisco, for those of you who have who know the Bay Area, Berkeley is on the other side of the Bay Bridge uh, on the East Bay. So it's just a simple 20-minute subway ride to get to the city. Um, there's been a couple of trends, and you may or may not know this, but for some time, everyone kind of referred to Silicon Valley um, because we were referencing a lot of the startups were on the peninsula and a lot of the investors and VCs were on the peninsula. But there's actually been a shift for a lot of the startups and VCs to move up toward the city. So geographically, we were actually in a very good position to be more closely really, you know, tied to a lot of the entrepreneurs and VCs, which are just across the bay. So a quick overview of our history and timeline. Uh, the Accelerator actually was founded in 2012. Uh, in 20, originally the executive director was from Stanford, and then for those of you who know, um, Stanford is Berkeley's rival. Um, so then Caroline, who is a uh, third generation Cal alumni, she joined in 2014. Um, and that's actually, 2015 is when they, we created two separate programs, the cohort program and the hot desk program. In 2017, we raised our first fund, Fund One, which we're still in the middle of is 25 million. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we invest in, you know, we invest 100,000 in each of the cohort companies. Um, once we were able to close that fund, the caliber of startups that we were seeing were substantially increased. And the nice thing is that in raising fund one, most funds take an average of 18 months to close. We were able to close successfully in five months and were oversubscribed again, with a lot, a lot of the top uh, institutional investors from Sand Hill. Um, we are actually probably going to start raising Fund 2 in the next year. Um, so we're hoping to expand. Once, once we finish closing Fund 2, we'll hope to expand to three cohorts a year, and also we'll um, probably take on more office space and acquire third floor. Um, so this year, 2019, it's been a pretty busy year for us. At, at this point in time, we're, we have a, the most recent cohort. We had 800 plus applications. Again, 145 startups per cohort. Um, we have 195 advisors. And in January, we launched the Global Innovation Partner Program, which I'll go into greater detail 
Um, and this might be of interest for those of you that are uh, very interested in coming to SCADA. So by the numbers, a few key metrics. So over the, since the start of SkyDeck, in aggregate, uh, our SkyDeck teams have raised over a billion dollars. 25 have gone on to raise uh, Series A or B. And in terms of the free discounted resources, we have over $500,000 of resources. And what I mean by that is we, we broker a lot of partnerships with law firms, accounting firms, um, design firms, and all of them basically offer extremely discounted rates to our founders, web development firms, um, 11 ex exits through acquisition. Uh, every cohort ends with demo day, right? So all of our teams will work really hard for six months and then at the end of that we have demo day. And generally we have about 650 investors that show up. Um, on average, within a month after demo day, 65% of our, team, 65 of our teams will have successfully closed the term sheet. Um, and usually, if they, if they aren't able to close a term sheet within that first month, we'll continually help them. Like we don't, a lot of people ask me like, what happens if you, know, you have teams that don't, aren't successful and it takes them several months or even a year? Well, we don't just like drop them and say goodbye. We're very proactive in ensuring that either they have access to our space for free for another six months and access to our advisors so that we can continually help make the right interest so that they can get there. Um, so what else was I gonna, I was gonna also say, okay, so moving on actually to the Berkeley Acceleration Method. So what exactly do we offer as an accelerator? Well, I would say one of the key distinguishing factors is our program, which we call Berkeley B, B, BAM, is how we actually generally reference it. In 2012, uh, or 2014, Caroline sat down with a couple thought leaders and really started to go through and figure out what were the key elements of our program that we wanted to share with our founders. And I, I mentioned this because not all accelerators will cover on all of these components. Um, y Combinator notoriously has a, a very kind of narrow focus and you know, t with 10 weeks, they just, you know, when you start, my brother that was actually a YC founder, when you start at YC, Paul Graham tells you to really focus on product development, and that becomes a very singular focus as a founder. Uh, at Skydeck, we take a very different approach. You have six months with us. That means that you, we don't want you to just focus on one thing. We want you to actually have a, take a holistic approach and look at and consider all the different facets of what it takes to run a successful startup, including go-to-market strategy, you know, product development, fundraising, you know, customer development. So like really the entire gamut of what it really takes to be successful will cover on. So that means over 50 workshops over six months. It's a lot of programming. And then 200 advisor office hours. One of my, part of my role as head of program is to actually ensure that our founders get the exact content and programming they want. So when we, at orientation day, which we just had two weeks ago for the new cohort, um, I kind of shared with our founders, it is my job to understand what your needs are and hunt down that particular program. So by way of example, one of our founders last year was like, our, my, our entire team need, is on JIRA, but nobody really understands how to use JIRA, right? Which is a very popular tool these days for project management. So I went and got a JIRA speaker. Another team wanted to understand the elements of really kind of best practices for project management. And I went and got um, someone who is like an internationally renowned project management expert to come and speak on that. So really there's no topic that is too elementary for us to focus on because frankly, if any of our founders are lacking in a particular area, again, we make it our business to kind of fill in those gaps. Um, the advisors for us are one of the single most important assets. So consider this as global founders. If, you're, if your company is mature enough to be thinking about global expansion, and you're going to an American accelerator with the end goal of success, successfully expanding across North America, how do you plug in and basically have the, a robust network that can actually introduce you to all of the right customers that you need to be talking to. For instance, one of our companies, which was, which was a legal tech company, last cohort, they came in, um, the CEO was, is a lawyer, um, but he's from, you know, went to, got, got his graduate degree at Cambridge, so mostly his network is in England. 
um, and they're trying to expand their legal tech product throughout the US. So our advisors, every cohort team gets three key advisors, and that's after a whole extensive uh, advisor meet and greet process. But our advisors go out of their way to make warm introductions. So by way of example, this particular founder, the, C the CEO of this legal tech company, got tens of really high level intros to top tier law firms. Um, you know, similarly, we did this for an, a med tech company, which um, one of our teams is a medical scribe company, and they needed to be able to, to meet a lot of hospitals and also small, small medical practices across the US. Through our advisor network, we were also able to get them countless intros. And that just makes the co customer development process so much easier, which ends up being one of the greatest challenges for most of these teams, right? So we have four types of advisors. The key advisors, which as I mentioned, every team has three key advisors. Um, general advisors, uh, we had, again, I showed you the earlier site. Over 200 advisors came in over the last six months. They're usually in our office for a minimum of four hours. That's actually their commitment. They come in like for one, once a month or once every other month for four hours. And they all have, their, the advisors cover on all the different areas of expertise in various industries. Most of our alumni that graduate from Skydeck, they stay really close to Berkeley, and we host a lot of networking events so that our current founders can plug into the recent graduate network and get more intros. And of course, we have Skynet. I call it Skynet, but Sky Network, um, which is, we have so much, again, as at UC Berkeley, I mentioned we have 500,000 living alumni. We get a lot of inbound inquiries and interest as to how some of these alumni can help. And, and so we basically have a LinkedIn group called Sky Network, which any of our founders can search and identify people who have already opted in to help. So a few stats about the advisors. Again, we're nearing 200 advisors. We're very selective. The number one criteria I vet for is passion to mentor and advise founders and really go out of their way to help. All of our advisors are volunteer. They're mostly successful past entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs. So 40% of them are actually angel investors and often invest in our companies. And 85% of them are Berkeley alumni. The rest of them are just passionate entrepreneurs that want to be part of our ecosystem. Beyond that, one of the other things that we have uh, is the faculty in residence program. So you can imagine how having a, a certain professor who is very renowned in a certain field or your, the field that you're working in, having a, an advisor who is known attached to your company can really help accelerate the raise, right? So um, in one of these, past co recent cohorts, one of the Argentinian com companies that was coming in got matched with one of our faculty and residents, um, were able to include this fac professor on their pitch deck. And that actually helped them quickly close funding because it gave them validation, gave investors uh, you know, the sense that the, this team was actually legitimate. And so a lot of our faculty go out of their way to make time and work really closely with our founders. button that can fail. Okay, so a little bit more about the program and actually how it works. We have three different programs. The cohort program is about the 20 to 25 teams we invest in. That's, the, you know, 100,000 that we invest in for the six months are with us. Um, and generally, it's a, the same terms as the safe note, which is quite standard in Silicon Valley. The safe note means you get about 100,000 investment for 5% equity. You may ask, why would anyone do that? Why would you give 5% of your company for just $100,000, right? The Korean government is giving way more than 100,000. Well, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. The reason companies do that is because they understand the value of coming to an accelerator being able to access all these resources, and again, primarily the network. I can't emphasize that enough. The network helps you find your best customers, helps you get in touch with all of the right investors. Right, I mentioned Demo Day, 650 investors. <laughs> you have five minutes with 25 teams on stage. Most of our teams have 50 investor meetings in the next 30 days. 
And most of our founders are completely exhausted by that. But <laughs> they're successful in raising because we set them up for success. The second program is the hot desk program. So the first one is the accelerator for later, like more mature companies that have more market traction. Usually they're 20 to 200,000 per month. So MRR, basically monthly recurring revenue. Um, for the hot desk, that's the, our incubator track. They're a little bit earlier stage. They generally are pre-revenue and have a you know working prototype or MVP. And finally, the global innovation program. That is actually for any founders or startups that are coming from abroad, right? So they might you know come to Skydeck through say a Korean accelerator that they're tied to, and we have a partnership with that accelerator. Then they can actually those partner global accelerators would help pick the companies that come to us. Now for any Korean entrepreneurs in the audience, you can actually directly apply to the cohort program, although the acceptance rate is 3%. So in the last, <laughs> in the most recent selection process, we only invested in 23 companies out of uh, 850 applications. So, um, but the global innovation track is probably a, a much easier way to get it. The global innovation partner program you come to Skydeck for three months. Um, the only difference too is we don't actually host demo day for partner uh, global innovation partners. And finally, within our entire organization, we have two specialty tracks as well: the bio track and the chip track. And that just helps us as we as we grow. Um, you know, we want to see more. We do have we take companies from all different industries, but we wanted to see more biomedtech companies and ship companies. So we started those tracks to, to basically target more of those companies. Um, this slide kind of just highlights briefly the, t the kind of stats of some of the recent companies that have gone on to do really well. Uh, for those that, are any of you familiar with Lime, the little sc scooter? <laughs> so they were a hot disk company. Um, at the time that they came through Skydeck, we didn't have a fund yet. Otherwise, we would have invested and we would have you know, done quite well. Um, most of our you know, early founders were all tied to Berkeley. Again, as I mentioned, that's not the case anymore because 50% of our cohort founders are international founders. Um, but yeah, they've all generally gone on to do really well. In the case of Symbio, uh, when they showed up at Skydex doorstep, they had a deck and two founders. That was it. They didn't really have a prototype. <laughs> so we believe in ideas early and we're willing to, to work with companies at all different stages. One of the other things that I think is a hallmark of many successful accelerators is the ability to connect with corporate partners. Uh, for a lot of, you want to do this for a lot of reasons, right? Because building a startup, you want to be able to quickly and seamlessly set up POCs that help you test and validate whether your product has any legs. Um, the more partners you have, the easier it becomes to set up your team, your startups, and connect them to the right people so they can actually have certain engagements and pilots. Um, these resource partners, in this case, the resource partners come into our office and they offer a lot of discounted resources as well. So, a little bit about the talent pool, because this is another key thing that I don't, you, I can't overstate the value, right? So, <laughs> UC Berkeley, I mentioned the huge alumni network, but the reality is there are 35,000 there are 20,000 undergraduates and 15,000 graduate students at UC Berkeley every year. Okay, so here I kind of call out, we have five key partners on campus that we work with. And on average, most of our startups take three to 10 interns, all unpaid, right? So we have postdoc matching. We do networking so that most companies, if they need certain postdocs to help facilitate some research, uh, last cohort, we had one company that had three postdocs. MBAs, most of our companies have three MBAs working for them. Again, unpaid, but they get free consulting around financial planning, like you know, business strategy, market, marketing strategy. Uh, Berkeley, one of the most popular majors at Berkeley right now is data science. There are a thousand undergraduate students studying data science. And that means Again, most of our companies, you know, because data is, you know, this is kind of stating the obvious, but data science is so important for so many companies these days, and having, you know, data scientists, interns helping is really helpful. We also have the MET program, 
which is basically the top 1% of engineering and business students. Most of them, we guarantee them an internship with any one of our SCADIC companies. Um, and that gives our teams access to top engineering and business talent from UC Berkeley. Um, and separately, we have BearX, which basically helps all of our companies. If they're looking for a co-founder, they can plug into the BearX network and or they can look for co-founders or interns. So generally, as I, as I said again, if you, you know, one of the other challenges for any team to grow is scaling up and finding the right talent. And we make that really easy. Um, here's another kind of summary of the various partnerships that we have across campus. Um, one of the unique things that people don't know about Skydeck is that our fund is set up in such a way that we return 50% of the carry back to UC Berkeley. So we actually get no funding from Berkeley, but we once the, the profit comes in, we give 50% of the carry back. Why do we do that? That's a question that a lot of universities that are trying to create their own accelerators ask us. And the reality is we see what we're doing as an impactful mission as well to funding the next generation of education. Um, you know, generally, you see schools are always a little bit tight on budget. So, if we can get one or two unicorns and you know exits, that already helps us. Like the the fifty percent carry that goes back to the university can fund many years of education. So we actually see our mission not as a parochial narrow scope of just helping founders and startups, but we see our mission as helping improve education across California. All right. So trends in Silicon Valley. And this is very much from my own personal observation. Um, so first of all, before I jump into this slide, prior to uh, actually joining Skydeck, I was trying to transition into venture capital myself. And um, I did 20 informational interviews with VCs to understand how they felt about their jobs, what was keeping, you know, what kind of changes or shifts or trends had they observed in Silicon Valley as VCs. And I was meeting VCs that were angels, you know, working at studios, working at micro VCs, large top firms, you know, and then what I realized is this. There's, there, there's been one kind of shift that all agree to, agree has been happening over the past couple years. You have SoftBank, which is a major VC firm, uh, the Japanese VC, in the Bay Area. And now they're writing checks to the tune of 200 or 500 million. That's actually creating a serious inflationary pressure on a lot of VCs. And a lot of VCs report the feeling that they have to pound the pavement to look at way more deals, court mediocre founders. This is, I'm quoting one of the VCs. Quote, you know, basically pound the pavement, meet a lot of founders, and they're having a hard, because they have to get in earlier, right, in order to compete with the likes of SoftBank. Um, this actually makes their job very um, frustrating and, and so one of the things that this has kind of created is the, it's actually helped accelerators um, grow in general importance. And the reason is a lot of the accelerators end up serving as a way to de-risk the deal flow that a lot of the VCs are looking at, right? So you, I was explaining this to a Korean accelerator I met yesterday. They were trying to understand what does it mean to de-risk. Um, so basically, you know, when you're as a VC or an investor, anytime you're looking at a company, there are so many, you know, points of validation you want to look at before you actually invest, right? Um, a lot of VCs will look at anywhere from 500 to 1,000 deals before making one investment. Uh, but it's still always very risky to, to deploy capital because if you invest in too many companies that go nowhere, then your job's on the line, right? So in many ways, the accelerators in working with companies like working with companies for six months, making sure that they've hit certain milestones, ensuring that they have a certain level of market traction and have hit a certain monthly recurring revenue, um, and that they have certain data points that by the time they get on stage for demo day, they're able to tell a credible story about how far they've come and where they're going. And that actually helps VCs understand, hey, this crop of you know, cohort teams a lot of them are really interesting, and this is a believable story, like also because they made it through Skydeck or any of these other accelerators. So that's one shift that I've seen. Again, the inflationary pressure on VCs and what that's meant for the, for the rising importance of, these, of accelerators. 
Um, in, in January, Forbes ran a piece about the top five university accelerators, and they listed um, Harvard, Berkeley, MIT, uh, Stanford. Um, and so, again, I think that there's there's a trend that certain you know it's a lot of these universities are you know they see the opportunity they have such a crop of talent that they can nurture and many of them not all of them in fact most of these are closed systems and are not accepting global founders but you know Skydeck does and we we see this opportunity to bring in outside global talent and marry it with the resources that we offer so that's kind of been one interesting trend um, the other thing that I would say is in terms of the general shifts and trends, uh, I would say that there's two things. One, the type of technology that's really interesting to VCs is continually shifting and changing. Between the last cohort applications and this current batch, we saw a 30% rise in companies that have an AI or that are AI enabled, right? So that actually kind of we kind of are able to attract a lot of you know, interesting companies and help vet and filter them to, to the attention of certain VCs. The third thing I would say is that, you know, the tech industry is continually shifting and there are always various changes. In the past year or two, we saw kind of the very kind of embarrassing debacle for Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, right? Um, especially around the lack of kind of attention and concern for individual consumer data and privacy. Well, the reality is, we see hundreds of companies, and as accelerators, we actually see it as our responsibility to continually program you know, relevant content so that our, our founders are thinking about these issues, right? Because the next generation of millennial consumers, they actually really care about sustainability, security, and privacy. And so, you know, one of the things that I would say is, if you don't go through an accelerator, it's hard to kind of know and keep your finger on the pulse as to what shifts and trends are happening, right? But if you're kind of in this chamber where you, you, you're, you're around people that are in it and they're really pay, paying attention to what's happening, it's really easy to access programming and actually be at the forefront <coughs> and really knowledgeable. Beyond that, we have a lot of programming. So for instance, uh, in terms of the ethics, we have this cohort, I have a, a workshop on the ethics of tech leadership. Uh, another, one, another area that we're really concerned about is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we, we see how important that is, especially for AI-enabled companies, right? It's frightening to me that 99% of PhDs graduating in AI and machine learning are white male. That's, that's a huge problem for anyone that doesn't agree with me. Like, you know, there need to be more women and just different races that are kind of also involved in helping build the next generation of companies. And we're very aware of these issues and we take measures to ensure that there is greater diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, so this slide I kind of threw up there because for those of you that are kind of, again, con contemplating accelerators, um, the, the reality is there are various cities that are really taking off and booming, right? Most of these have access to strong engineering talent or business talent um, and capital. But at the end of the day, I would say that it's probably still fair to say that the East Coast, you know, between Boston, Austin, and the Bay Area, Bay Area, you know, The Economist, um, I think two years ago, listed San Francisco as the number one best place for tech innovation, followed by Berlin. Um, but yeah, it's fair to say that these, are, these cities are really on the rise. Uh, but if you're trying to make it in the US market, you really want to look at these cities, and primarily the Bay Area. Um, this kind of photo is kind of a summary photo. Again, just to kind of show something fun. That at the end of, you know, even though our founders come and they work really hard, at the end of the day, the payoff is being able to fundraise successfully and go on to launch nationally um, and really grow your company. So that is it. Oh wait, oh I didn't, sorry, I realized I added two slides. Um, the, global, the Global Innovation Partner Program. So I mentioned that uh, these accelerators are really acting as a sandbox for global innovation. Um, and I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about what that means. So when we launched the Global Innovation Partner Program, which we call GIP for short, um, that was really intended for us to help more global teams 
access Skydeck. Um, it's been really great for me to be in Seoul for a couple days and meet with so many Korean accelerators um, and understand just like the need to, and the channels that are required to help a lot of Korean startups go global. Um, this cohort, we have 17 teams or startups from three different countries. So they're coming from China, Taiwan, and Italy. And it would be great um, internally on the, like at the office. I'm always, you know, I'm always excited. I would love, I would love to see more Korean startups come through Skydeck. Um, we generally have about one company per cohort, and I'd like to see tens <laughs> of companies coming through every cohort. Here's an example of one our most recent Korean company, Monit. Tony, the CEO, is a former Samsung, and when he actually was trying to get his own IoT baby sensor company off the ground. He actually found six of his colleagues at Samsung and they spun out and went and started, sorry, started Monit. Um, and one of the reasons, so at that point in time when they were, um, before they got to Skydeck, they were already making a million annual revenue. But the reason they actually considered Skydeck as a launch pad uh, is actually very simple, right? They, they saw the opportunity to plug into a network and expand quickly especially as the next two markets they were expanding in were the U.S. and Mexico. So, you know, one of the, as, a, as an example, when Tony came to Skydeck, one of the key challenges he had was finding the right marketing hire. Um, and just like answering a lot of questions about general liability insurance and all these, you know, things that he had to check off the list in order to establish himself in the U.S. And, one of the nice things about Skydeck is we're able to really kind of facilitate and answer these questions really quickly for all of our founders and help them focus on what they really need to focus on, which is building their business. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, so our next application period is December 15th to January 15th, and it's, you can apply through our website, skydeck.berkeley.edu. And I'll also have cards up here later, which I'm happy to give you the information and share. to the news, you know. So it's very expensive, and that's actually why most of our companies, when they graduate, they stay in Berkeley. And the city of Berkeley, which we work very closely with, has been building out a lot of physical infrastructure, office building, and space for companies to stay. Again, as I mentioned, with a only 20-minute subway ride to San Francisco, Berkeley has become really attractive for a lot of founders. So I think within five years, Berkeley, within the Bay Area, Berkeley is going to be very special. Again, you know, it's only within the past, since 2017, that our presence has grown substantially when we, after we raise the fund. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions? Oh, okay. Yeah, our LPs are primarily, um, so LPs are like investors in you know, funds like ours. Um, they're mostly institutional VCs from Silicon Valley, like Sequoia or Mayfield or Canvas are some of our um, VCs from Silicon Valley, from Sand Hill. But we actually take global LPs as well. So we did have, you know, we do have some Chinese LPs and otherwise. No. I'm looking for Korean LPs too, if there are any in the audience. Okay, so we will check the slate.com where there has some questions. And firstly, 
Our investment and accelerating are focused on Berkeley Startup Venture. Uh, our investments and accelerating are focused on the Berkeley Startup Venture. Um, no, we're not just focused on Berkeley startups or founders. Uh, I would say for the Hot Dust program, the incubator track, they're mostly Berkeley or UC affiliated. Mm -hmm. But for cohort, the accelerator track, we actually primarily accept, you know, as I mentioned, 50% of our companies are from around the world. There's no UC affiliation. None of them have a Berkeley affiliation at all. Um, so yeah, we're, you know, we're trying to compete. We don't see ourselves as just a university accelerator. We're, we see ourselves as, you know, a future competitor of Y Combinator, and you know, really kind of rising in the ranks. Um, so Berkeley actually is number three in the in terms of most uh, graduating the most number of funded founders that have raised over one million. But we are looking for founders from all over. Okay. This next question: How was the important to make pro, pro portfolio and venture capital of Berkeley? How important is it for the um, venture? Need portfolio and venture capital of Berkeley. Yeah. Sorry, do you have the written version? I don't think <laughs> <laughs> How much is affecting the portfolio and venture capital of Buckley? Um, I think if I understand your question correctly, you're trying to understand how important the portfolio is. For, like, how are we choosing the portfolio? How much for important to make the portfolio and venture capital of Buckley? Buckley. Um, does anyone want to clarify about what that question means? Sorry, I didn't. I still don't get it. I think anyone <laughs> want to take a stab at what that means? Okay, so I will <laughs> ask you the other question. Do you have any different things from the Stanford program, or such as for the other university? Oh yeah, how are we differentiated? So that's a great question. We are again, we're super hands-on. Most of the accelerators don't offer the breadth of uh, programming and also just the very in-depth mentorship and advising. So um, I think StartX, if I'm not wrong, they don't, or Y Combinator, or any of these other university accelerators, like you, you're not there in the office with staff and with all these advisors around you all the time, right? Like I would say if I could boil it down to one word, it's just that we're super hands-on. That's it, like we're hands-on. <laughs> I mean, most of our founders that are in cohort have been through other accelerators, including um, Alchemist or Techstars, and n not discounting of those other great programs. I'm just saying that uh, we've gotten feedback that we're, you know, having gone through other programs before, our founders have reported that we are the most hands-on and they got the most kind of productive six months out of being part of our accelerator. Okay, someone lays hands, so could you pass the microphone to him? Hey, uh, um, I think the question about the portfolio, yeah. if I understand, I think what they need to say is when you guys are taking in applications, does your strategy start with like designing the portfolio of the type of companies that you want, or do you have um, some other way of selecting and then that class makes up the portfolio? Yeah. Fantastic question. Most of our, we, the only criteria that we have is we try to look for deep tech companies, right? So there has to be a real, the technology that the team brings to the table should be proprietary, unique, and differentiated, and defensible long term. Um, but beyond that, it's not like we come into the, you know, the selection process and say, okay, we're going to choose, you know, 10% uh, AR companies and 15% consumer tech or 15% enterprise SaaS, not at all. Like we basically are evaluating solely on the, just like the unique value proposition and the strength of the team and the technology. Okay, so do you have any question for, oh, yeah, one more question. Can I ask my own question now? Yeah. Okay, um, so suppose that I'm not a Berkeley student and I'm not a startup founder <laughs> and I don't have any sponsors, I just want to, follow the American dream and buy a ticket and go to Berkeley and start hanging around there, how can I get involved with the startups at Skydive? Yeah, that's a great question. We have so many people that come and they want to be involved. So that's a fantastic question. You know, the reality is we even just had recently a Canadian founder who 
just picked up and moved to Berkeley. And uh, you know, like you generally, you have to have like a Berkeley connection. Um, you know, so a lot of times we'll say, you know, connect with, you know, a Berkeley founder or like try to network. We have 20 plus public facing events a year, each cohort. So it's really easy to come and meet our founders and then work your way into being an unpaid intern or get hired on as you know, a project manager or web developer or graphic designer. So it's actually easier than people think. <laughs> Thank you for an answer. Anyone else? OK, so. Thank you for your presentation, and we will end the section. Please give us a big hand again. Thank you, guys. Have a round of applause.